Today we're joined with Dr. Jean Hebert, neurogeneticist at Albert Einstein College of Medicine. The Hebert Lab is his mission is to restore brain function with tissue engineering. Uh, and I just want to you know thank everyone for coming out today and John for being on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me on, Lowell. Just as like a fun aside, because uh, I was looking through Twitter, I was looking through all the things that you talk about, and I've had people on who talk about uh, neural engineering, you know, brain computer interfaces. And I, I always ask them, like, which one do you think will be more uh, functionally restorative when it comes to TBI events? So if you had your bet, you know, 10 years from now, five years from now, that type of thing, which one do you think would be more restorative? A brain computer interface in terms of function or uh, a technology like yours that can go in there and either replace or rejuvenate a uh, uh, damaged tissue. Yeah, it depends for what. For spinal cord repair or, or bypassing the spinal cord, TBI will probably get us there faster um, because it can already do. It can already bypass the spinal cord, right? So mm. these machines can interpret intentions very quickly and then <clears throat> signal to the rest of the body to control motor movement. So we're already almost there. It's just that the devices are not yet portable, but groups are working on that. For brain damage itself, um, there really isn't much that brain machine interfaces can do yet, because what they're good at is interpreting you know, the, your intentions. And if your brain is damaged, you don't even have the intentions anymore to mm -hmm. be coded. Uh, so brain tissue replacement will it seems more likely to be effective sooner than uh, BMIs for that, um, because there there are other reasons for that too that that we can get into. But we basically we have a blueprint for how the brain is normally built, which is during development. No one built our brains, right? They came mm -hmm. from fetal tissue. Whereas for BMIs, they're sort of starting from scratch, and they really don't have a good way of mimicking brain function yet um so it's a less clear path i think what made aging the thing that you wanted to dedicate your life to and then what uh focused you to be a neurogenesis to to as the thing that you wanted to apply into to combat aging well i it was at a young age the realization that we do age and fall apart and die i i never got okay with that so, you know, that was, I guess, a time when kids generally awaking to the world and, and, you know, what is the world about? What am I about? And then you realize, oh, in the end, you're just gonna fall apart and die. And so that uh, very early on was a, a trigger for me to start working on this. And, you know, through high school, <clears throat> I started reading, um, everything I could about genetics and how we can potentially control. At any point in this conversation, if you find value in it, please subscribe. It is hugely beneficial and it tells Google and everyone out there that this is content worth watching. Thank you for everyone thus far who has commented, liked, subscribed, and told their friends. How we're made with genetics and got my PhD in genetics eventually, because I really thought, you know, the code of life, you know, how could that not provide the answer? Uh, but then realize that it, for aging, it actually it can't really provide the answer in any uh, reasonable time scale, or certainly not for people that are already around today. Um, and that's because a lot of what happens during aging is stochastic, complex damage to the components that make up our body, proteins, DNA, uh, fats, sugars. And there, there is no genetically encoded um, pathways for reversing this damage. So, you know, it, manipulating the genome or the epigenome um, might have some health benefits, but it's not going to get rid of aging or, or probably not even slow it down. Then you parlay that with, uh, how, do you, how do you go from, from that to what you're doing now. Yeah, so exactly. <laughs> so I think a lot of the approaches that people are focused on currently for uh, dealing with aging um, are going to have very little impact on aging itself, although it might, they might increase health as we nevertheless age. 
I think the only way of getting rid of this stochastic complex damage that occurs to different classes of our, the molecules that make up our body um, is to replace tissue. And so that's the approach that we're tasting, taking is tissue replacement. Um, and it makes sort of intuitive sense for the rest of the body, right? You can even conceive of replacing the whole body with, you know, a, a headless body, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, take an old body, replace it with a young body, and then, you know, your body's young again. Uh, yeah. Unfortunately, your brain is still old and still aging. Uh, and, and so does this apply to the brain? And I think it does if you do it progressively over time, because there's good evidence um, that that you can do this without a uh, loss of function or self-identity. Uh, so that's, that's what we're focused on, is to be able to progressively replace brain tissue, which in combination with replacement of the whole body or body parts uh, can really make you young again. With, with the graphs themselves, is it possible to get granular in terms of how the grafting works so that you'd be able to, let's say like you took like a snapshot of that part of the brain and you could uh, layer it or set it up in such a way where it was more or less the same as what it was, or does it have to be kind of like fresh and then you don't do too much so it doesn't like override or uh, destroy important parts of the brain? Yeah, so the replacement process itself is <clears throat> not the most intuitive thing. So you don't, mm -hmm. you don't look at how it's made right now and and replace it exactly the same way that would be next to impossible because mm. it's very hard to figure out what the connections are in a part of the brain without destroying it um, so that would be very difficult to do but there are two reasons why you don't have to do it that way which wouldn't work anyway uh, one is that our brains in particular the parts of our brains that we use to uh for higher cognitive functions like what i'm using now to try to formulate you know comprehensible sentences to you and what you're using to try to decipher what i'm saying uh the neocortex that part of the brain uh is super plastic so functions can move over time from you know one part of that tissue to another part of that tissue without us even noticing um, so that, and that's been demonstrated across species that have neocortex and in humans of advanced age. So, um, so that means that, you know, you could potentially move functions from an old part of the brain to newer parts of the brain without you even noticing. Mm. The other part of the equation here that makes this worth considering and worth pursuing as an approach is that, again, we didn't build our neocortex, right? It developed from um, very simple structures in the fetus, where these cells are essentially pre-programmed to give fully mature functional tissue. So, um, and, and people, many different labs, including ours, have transplanted these cells and demonstrated that they don't seem to care that they're in the adult environment or even a damaged adult environment. They go about their business of trying to give rise to new functional tissue. Those cells don't succeed because we're not putting them in there the right way. And, and those are the things that we're figuring out is how to do that, how to put them in there so that they develop and differentiate and integrate normally with the adult brain. Mm. What? How long, I imagine there's like a, a, a number of steps between where you are now and something that someone could be using even for compassionate uh, reasons. I mean, you're, you're still in the mice models. What would be a, like a rough timeline before something could be more uh, like the, what's left of the technology to develop so that you know you can translate it out into a startup or, or license the IP for someone to develop into something that would be directly applicable to people? Yeah, I think we can start, you know, developing IP immediately because we're in order to reverse engineer this early tissue, which can give rise to functional new tissue in the adult brain, you know, we're making a lot of sort of discoveries of, of mm. how things work, uh, which are useful um, and, and, you know, have value intel intellectual property wise. Not that that's what we're after here. We're really after a way of replacing uh, mm -hmm. brain tissue with new brain tissue. 
Um, but but there certainly is um, a role for industry to play in this, you know, to accelerate the progress that we're making. Currently, our academic lab, you know, is making rather slow pro progress on this front and having industry or private partners, whether philanthropic or, you know, with commercial interests, uh, come in and accelerate this will uh, will be greatly beneficial to us. Uh, but you're asking about the timeline too, like how long. Um, I mean, we, we're, we're trying to set up a company now for the purpose of accelerating this. We, we, we have um, some committed funders already, um, but we haven't kicked off yet. Um, but even with that, you know, even if we got all the money in the world, uh, I don't think we could have a, a, a tissue ready before five years to try mm -hmm. people. And, and that's really like the fastest imaginable possible time before going into humans. It could, of course, take a lot longer, you know, 10 to 15 years. Or if things don't accelerate and, you know, we don't get uh, support <laughs> and sponsorship for this, it could take, you know, 50 years or... or mm. What would your role be at the startup? Would you stay in your lab and, and uh, be like a George Church? like? helping people out or would you be like the CSO or something? Yeah, no, I, I'm committed to this project, uh, whether this project is in the lab or if the project transitioned to industry or some type of institute or, you know, whatever the, the, uh, the mechanism for moving it forward, um, I will be 100% involved with this project. So I, I'm not anchored in uh, academia and I'm not necessarily driven to be uh, just an industry. I, I'm really guided by what will make this project move uh, fastest forward. And, and yeah, I, I, you know, I would be um, sort of hopefully uh, involved, if not heading the, the scientific uh, development of, mm -hmm. of this replacement tissue. How do you think how do you think about the adjustment and timeline when you have an academic lab versus a startup or something like that? The I, I know many uh, people who have made that transition and the hardest thing is getting people to not have the academic mindset in terms of developing something, mm -hmm. uh, even in terms of how they structure teams and, and whatnot. So I'm, I'm curious as, as you're thinking of the, the company, I, I imagine there's a part of you thinking like how would how's the production going to look like? What would that change look like? Yeah, I it's really the benefit again is acceleration right mm -hmm. uh, that comes primarily from funding in an academic lab it's very flat over time you know you you publish papers you renew your grants you publish more papers you renew your grants um so funding and progress occurs at a, at a at a very you know flat rate i guess uh whereas in industry you meet your milestones uh, and then you know the money gets bigger and bigger exponentially. So you can really start to get things done. Um, and so the idea is that with more people working on this over time, um, a lot of the uh, problems that we face in terms of, oh, should we do it this way? Or should we try it this way or this way? Instead of trying one, then the other, then the third, we could do them all in parallel, mm. you know, get an answer much quicker. So meet, meet our milestones much quicker um, and, and make progress in developing, um, again, this, this replacement tissue that we uh, look forward to doing. That makes sense, the parallelism. The, is there a startup or industry lab that you've gone to, to, you know, I think they say great artists steal, so like steal their methodology for to running a, a startup type lab versus an academic type lab? Yeah, no, I, I have to admit, you know, I don't have experience in industry, even though mm -hmm. you know, we're going in that direction to accelerate the project. So, um, you know, I, I'm certainly not of the of a corporate nature <laughs> in terms yeah. of running things. I, I very much like uh, to have open discussions and debates about the approaches we're taking. And um, I, I look to hire people that are like mind who, who are, you know, want to discuss, think mm -hmm. about, and then try that aren't afraid to try and fail. Um, because there's a lot of that in, in, in the R and D that, that we're undertaking. 
Um, so th that's certainly the culture I would foster, you know, beyond that, um, you know, there's al also a sense of urgency, you know, we can't take too long to, mm -hmm. to get this done. Yeah. And then, uh, do you know the amount you're trying to raise? Like there are, there are a lot of, uh, venture capitalists that listen in. So maybe someone out there is like, oh, that's in my pocketbook. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> Anybody listening who's interested, that would be great. Um, so we're, uh, we're before we start hiring, uh, we want to have, you know, somewhere in the order of 2.2 million, uh, in the bank. Uh, and we're like uh, just over 75% there now, mm -hmm. uh, but then we'll keep the seed round. So this is seed round funding. We're going to keep that open for, um, a while to, to increase it, uh, you know, maybe a hundred percent, um, before closing the seed round. Um, and then of course, after that, you know, uh, it's all dependent on milestones and yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Well, anyone out there reach out to, to John, the, in terms of your technology, I was curious what you think about it as a compare and contrast for Michael Levin's work, where he sees the hardware of things. Uh, he sees like there's a hardware and then there's a software level. I don't know if you're familiar with Michael Levin. He's, I think he's yeah, kind of yeah. near. Okay. Yeah, so yeah. How, what do you see the difference of approaches where his is software level, where he just puts the right material in the area and then he gives it the right chemical bath essentially. And then the cells will regrow and do it that way versus uh, your method, which seems more, you, you graft it in, and then the, I guess it's not too dissimilar, actually, now I'm thinking about it, but yeah, how do you, how do you see that? There is, there is in fact, uh, quite a bit of overlap there, because yeah. the goal is to generate new tissue. And, uh, you know, however you do that, um, it's a good way of replacing all the pre-existing damage. Mm -hmm. I think because of the complexity and stochastic nature of that damage, the only way of, of really um, rejuvenating the tissue or, or, you know, reversing aging in that tissue. Um, so, yeah, so there is overlap. Um, I think for the brain, a big problem is the lack of stem cells. Um, I say that and people go, oh, no, no, there's stem cells in the brain. Yeah, yeah, but they're restricted to very small areas. Much is made of them, uh, but they have very limited potential, uh, very, um, well encoded fates. Uh, so it's not like they can replace neocortical tissue, for example, they're very restricted to another part of the brain called the dente gyrus, gyrus which is a small part of the hippocampus. Um, and it's actually still a little controversial whether the stem cells in humans are there, but, but it, there's enough evidence to, to suggest they might be. Um, and so there are unlike Michael's work there, you know, there are no cells that we can, uh, that are there that we can coax to, to, you know, generate new tissue. So instead of that, we put them in ourselves mm. because we know how to make them from human induced pluripotent stem cells. Um, and again, it's not just one cell type, right? It's whole tissue regeneration, which again is what Michael is doing. So, um, you know, kudos to him for, for taking that approach. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wonder if uh, at some point there, his technology might interface with your technology as you replace what's there for his stuff to to work in. That might be some interesting um, uh, synergy. But so neocortical precursor uh, cell types. I was when I was reading your work, and I tried reading as much as your research as I could uh, with being a layman. The uh, how do you decide what cell types to 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 include and what not to include? Because you don't. Want, I mean, you don't want like too many monkeys in the in the kitchen. Right. Yeah. So we're 100% guided by the way that it's done normally. So we have access okay. to human fetal neocortical tissue. Uh, and so we do, you know, high resolution analysis of the cell types that are there uh, early on. Um, and there are, you know, um, at least a half dozen different cell types that are required for normal uh, development of the tissue. Even though, like I said, many labs have taken the strict neocortical precursor cells for the principal neurons, transplanted them in adults, and they do remarkably well. They don't seem to care that they're in adults. They project long distances and connect with the brain, but they don't make functional tissue, so they're not really useful to the host. Uh, so it's only by really recapitulating normal 
um, neocortical development that we can hope to achieve functional tissue. And so we just base our choice of cell types on the ones that are there normally. We try to embed them in an environment, so an extracellular environment uh, that has the structural and um, you know, chemical components that are normally there as well. So we do like proteomics uh, analyses and we're going to start some glycomic analyses as well to try to get that right. Um, and then they, you know, we have to ensure that the interaction of those different cell types is occurring early on normally um, because they are um, key to you know, development uh, later on of that tissue. So, I mean, those are the things we're really um, focused on getting right. But we're not reinventing anything new. We're just sort of reverse engineering mm -hmm. what we know already works. So that makes our task in a way a lot easier. I mean, it's still a big project. Yeah. But, but you know, we don't have to invent anything new. Yeah. Is there a cell type in particular that is like the workhorse cell? And then I guess the joke would be, why is it not glial cells? But uh, is there one that like does the more work than the others? I mean, there, you know, everybody thinks as the precursors to the, of the principal neurons as the most important. And in a way they are, it's like, we need every part of our body to be <clears throat> alive, right? If we don't have kidneys, mm -hmm. we die. If we don't have lungs, we die. If we don't have but if we were going to pick one that we think is the most important, we'd probably pick our brain, right? Yeah. Because that's who we are. So the same thing at a cell level in the neocortex, all the cell types are essential uh, for the development of, and function of the tissue. But, you know, we kind of like the principal neurons because they're the ones that uh, convey the bulk of information processing, um, even though they can't do it normally without the other types of neurons that modulate their activity uh yeah so um you know and that's what most people uh transplant when they transplant a single cell type in the neocortex they transplant the precursor to these principal neurons um hmm. so yeah I, you know that's <laughs> I don't know if I answered your question or not. No, I did. I just, I, 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 you never know when you're interrupting or not. So I just let people talk. <laughs> but uh, what, what prevents scarring? So I worked at a brain computer interface startup for a little bit and the introduction of, of uh, electrodes, you had to find, I don't, I don't want to get too for IP stuff, but you had to be concerned about these things. So, but you're making lesions and you introduce uh, new tissue to it. And you even uh, like, uh, you add some media to like what like get the the blood out so before you introduce it but what's what's preventing the scarring from happening like any buildup yeah. or anything like that scarring is is something is a concern and and mm. it's something we definitely are always keeping an eye on um but we've managed to minimize scarring just by using you know strong anti-inflammatories at the site of the lesion uh once a lesion is made we, we basically soak it in these, you know, uh, steroidal anti-inflammatories, uh, which seems to help quite a bit. Um, and then shortly thereafter, we'll introduce our, you know, starter tissue. Mm. Um, it, and uh, it seems to, we seem to detect very little scar tissue between the, what we put in and, and the host tissue um, and, and lots of, uh, vascular connections and neuronal connections be between the border of the two. Um, so, you know, we're cautiously optimistic that we can move forward with that. But it's, you know, it is a, a concern that if there is any scar tissue, it can inhibit, um, you know, normal uh, neuronal connections with the host. Do you have to keep the anti-inflammatory? I imagine that like an organ transplant, I think it's to some extent you have to suppress the immune system so your body doesn't fight it off. For the, yeah. the transplanted tissue, do you have to do a similar uh, mechanism? Like do you have to continue administering that over the course of the life of the organism or is it just for that period where it's healing? Yeah, well, the, the anti-inflammatories is just for the period when mm -hmm. it's healing. Um, so, um, but the immune suppressants, those are necessary for... Um, longer periods of time when you haven't matched the cells to yeah. the donor uh, when they're not autologous 
uh, and especially when they come from another species, then you you need um, immune suppression at fairly uh, you know uh, vigorous levels for um, you know forever. <laughs> but that's not what we plan on doing. It's just preclinically, you know, we'll test our human um, you know structures, our human starter tissues in mice. And so those mice have to be heavily immune suppressed. Uh, when we do it in humans, um, if we do non-patient match, like not derived, if the cells and the components in the tissue are not derived from patient cells, then uh, we will also need to do immune suppression as they do currently for treat cell transplant treatments for Parkinson's um, and um, there's others as well that, that are in progress in clinical trials. Um, so there's a, you know, there's a pathway for doing this. There's a, you know, protocols for doing this. Um, in the brain is a little different than the rest of the body. Y you can escape the immune system more easily. So a lot of these, um, you know, approaches in humans where they don't use patient derived cells, they taper off the immune suppressants quite a bit over time, mm -hmm. um, and the cells still seem to survive. But ideally, we you know we want to go to patient derived. So the you know iPS cells derive from the patient that we're putting back the the brain tissue in. Um, that way, we don't need to use immune suppressants. We have to be very very careful though that there are not any undifferentiated. Uh, stem cells in there because they give rise to teratomas. But again, you know, these things uh, have been done in humans already, and there are protocols for, you know, really minimizing the risk that you do have any undifferentiated cells left. Are mice the best model outside of experimenting in humans? to do this type of research. I'm thinking of at UW Madison, they use Reese monkeys and, and other type of primates when they're doing uh, brain studies. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, best only in the sense that there are the lowest, you know, sentient mammals, mm -hmm. right? But not so good for um, what we eventually want to do, which is proof of concept that the tissue we've put in by virtue of its electrophysiological activity and integration with the rest of the brain is now encoding a useful function to the host. That is much harder to do, especially if we're trying human tissue at that point in the mouse than um, in like uh, an old world monkey like rhesus macaque or uh, or another type of old world monkey. Um, yeah, so, you know, those things um, would be, would give us more definitive answers uh, if we don't use rodents. Mice have the added benefit of their, their faster lived. Is that like a component that makes it easier for when you're doing academic or uh, translate it into a startup type scenario? Just the fact that you can do lesions and uh, see the full life in a, a shorter period of time to see if there's any developmental issues? Um, not, not, not for what we're doing. For a lot of cases, yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, you know, if, especially if you want to look at uh, effects on maximal lifespan in a mammal, well, you, you know, they have one of the shortest <laughs> lifespans, so they're, they're ideal for that. Uh, but for what we're doing, uh, it's not really an advantage. Um, their short life actually makes it, limits their, their usefulness to us because the human brain, uh, you know, takes from the early stages of fetal development to when it starts to be conscious and functional, let's say, you know, sometime after birth. So you're talking about at least a year or two, and then it continues to develop beyond that. And, and you know, so mice, mice, you know, don't even live that long. Mm -hmm. So again, in, te in terms of testing the, the human tissue that we're making, um, mice are limited both in the size of the neocortex, uh, but also in their lifespan. Um, so again, you know, the ultimate test uh, may have to come 
in primates, whether that be non-human primates or the human primates. Yeah. The, uh, so people, I, I'm wondering the implementation of a lot of this uh, that we've been talking about. And one person, this will be AI related, um, one person, uh, a listener asked, with the explosion in AI technology recently, does John have any, is that impacting the future of brain reg re regeneration? And is there anything AI related that you're working on now in the lab that you intend to incorporate or that you are incorporating it or that you're going to be doing in your startup as well? And this person's name is Paraphilus 075, which is a great name. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, yeah, I don't think I know this person, but yeah, thank you for the question. Um, yeah, we're not using anything uh, AI related at the moment in the lab. Um, you know, I, I and in terms of discovery or engineering the tissue, um, I can't conceive of a way that we can train an AI to be useful on that because the information is difficult to find. Where AI would be generally useful for people in the field of, of medicine and, and uh, health sciences would be to have uh, something like a a, uh, a chat GPT that has access to PubMed, mm -hmm. right? So so all scientific publications. So right now uh, they don't have access. So we still have to gather the, and go searching for information ourselves, uh, which is uh, somewhat time consuming. Um, I mean that's one you know sort of silly way that that AI could be helpful in the near term. Um, other ways are more have more to do with automation. And so a lot of uh, what we do is fairly labor intensive, um, but could be encoded in in a um, an AI that was trained to recognize growing cells and culture because we do a lot of that right. We need to generate a lot of of these brain cells and culture from from iPS cells or stem cells. Um, so automation in the, the culture procedure being training the AI to recognize, you know, what's, what are good cells, what are bad cells, um, and when to feed them, when to passage them, all these things could potentially be automated um, and would be wonderful uh, to have. Uh, and would take, you know, that would take like smart AI with combined with smart robotics to do that. And, and I think there are some groups working on that, um, but, but we haven't implemented yet. And, and hopefully mm -hmm. it will come soon. Um, the only other aspect that great to see some progress with some AI are, are some smart surgical robots. You know, but again, um, right now there's still um, you know people are developing these as well, but they're still sort of controlled by a surgeon. Um, but eventually, maybe they can be more independent. How would you use the surgical robots? Um, again, just for, uh, you know, the implanting our, our starter tissue into um, lesion brains, for example, um, that would require a robot can potentially see much better than us, can control hand motions much better than we can, or, you know, movement uh, of, of the tools much better than we can. Um, so the, the, you know, the risk of Hitting a blood vessel, for example, can be diminished. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah. That makes sense. And then uh, a part of what you're doing is genetically engineering microglia that disperse through the adult neurocortex to bolster the neocortical function. So, uh, two part question there: Why microglia? And then, uh, what are, is the engineering technique to engineer them? Yeah. So that's a completely different project. So, you know, there's really two projects in the lab. The big one is the tissue replacement one. That's what we're mainly focused on. Uh, but there is a residual project that is very interesting as well, using microglia as a way of delivering either cells or, or biologics like protein therapeutics, like antibodies, for example, uh, to the brain. Uh, it, and the reason that's sort of interesting is because right now there is no way of widely delivering payloads to the brain because of the blood-brain barrier. So if you systemically inject 
these protein-based therapeutics, um, they have very short half-lives, but they also don't cross the blood-brain barrier for the most part. Um, so you can't deliver them to the brain. So this project is to use microglia as sort of little delivery um, mechanisms for the brain. Because if you, uh, so, so the, what we can do, and others are doing this as well, is you can ablate, ablate the endogenous microglia transiently. They're important. You don't want to kill them off permanently. But if they're not there for a short period of time, it seems to be fine. Um, and then instead of having them repopulate from the few that are left, which they do, they're very driven to repopulate the entire central nervous system with new microglia when you do deplete them. Instead of letting them do that, you put in your engineered microglia and they repopulate instead. Um, and that way, if the engineered microglia are engineered in the sense that they're secreting like a good neurotrophic factor or anti-inflammatory factor or whatever you want for whatever disease you want, then those microglia are there uh, sort of producing this good factor over time. Um, you know, it's a sort of a one-time treatment as well. Um, and, and, um, and they distribute like throughout broad areas of the CNS. Um, which is needed for something like Alzheimer's or aging, which, you know, affects all parts of the brain. So if you want to deliver neurotrophic factors, they could be a good way of doing that. So for, for either approach, do you have, um, so Alzheimer's is one of the neurodegenerative disorders that you'd have, uh, damage to the brain. Those are the, what are some of like the key implications of the illnesses that you'd be able to help with or, or, or damage you'd be able to help with? Uh, yeah. So, for the microglia, you know, the advantage there is widespread delivery, mm -hmm. right? We're looking at more broadly degenerative conditions like Alzheimer's and aging. Um, for the tissue replacement, it's uh, initially we're focused on local damage like stroke or, uh, you know, trauma. But, we, but it, since it's the only way to actually reverse aging, um, what we want to do is implement that re the, the replacement of new tissue uh, progressively for large areas of the neocortex and eventually the rest of the brain uh, as well. Um, and, and so that is, um, you know, a step removed from, from immediate um, applications. We first have to show that we can make a tissue that is functional. Once we can do that, then we can consider wider spread damage, like what occurs in aging. Hmm. And uh, we have a, a longtime listener question coming in here with Nerd Generation. Uh, Town Grizzletown, which is a, a great name. What are your thoughts on how amyloid beta aggregates relate to Nerd Generation? Oh yeah, they they want me to get into that controversy. <laughs> yeah, I was going to ask it a different way, but you know, this one sounded more technical. Yeah, well, you know, again, you know, the evidence isn't great that they're a central driving factor um, of, of the disease. And so I think we need to look, those people who are interested in, specifically in Alzheimer's need to look beyond that and, and, and be open to other approaches um, to, to combating this disease. Do you have a pet theory, either that you think people are going in the right direction or that you think like maybe they should spend more time on this? Yeah, I, you know, I, I'm talking to a lot, a lot of people working on Alzheimer's and, and they each have their different theory. Mm. I'm not an Alzheimer's specialist. Some think it's, it's a vascular disease, you know, or it's this, you know, inflammatory. It's the microglia. It's, you know, one thing or another. Or, or, or it's amyloid, or it's tau, or, you know, or, or it's something else that happens earlier. You know, um, whatever is happening, it's happening in, in an old brain where everything is compounded by the fact that things are falling apart. Um, so, so my approach is let's just replace the tissue progressively over time. So now you have a young brain 
and you won't have Alzheimer's, you won't have aging, uh, and these other problems. Would you be able to replace the whole brain or only just the neocortex? Um, yeah, so the, the goal would be to replace the whole brain. Every part of the brain is essential for normal information processing the way we think of it as normal uh, at the moment. Um, and every part of the brain ages and falls apart. Um, the neocortex might be the most studied part of the brain in terms of how it develops. But for other parts of the brain, we have a fairly good understanding as well of all the early cell types that are there um, and that, that form that part of the brain. Um, so the idea would be when we want to reverse brain aging, and we know we can do it for the neocortex, is to also develop it for the other parts of the brain that uh, would make sense to replace at the same time as certain areas of the neocortex. For example, the visual neocortex, right? It goes through the visual thalamus, which is a different part of the brain than the neocortex. Um, and so having, and you can do it unilaterally, so having um, the, the cells that normally connect together and, and grow axons uh, during development be there doing that in the adult brain at the same time would probably uh, be the best way to get normal function again. Um, so you, you might want to do like sensory modules of different parts of the brain at the same time. Uh, but this is something that needs to be, you know, worked out and tested. Um, the associative parts of the human neocortex, those seem to be so plastic that, uh, you know, I don't think that those could probably be implemented at, at, at uh, any time or coincidentally with these more um, uh, primary functions of the neocortex, like visual processing, auditory processing, sensory processing. Yeah. So the, my follow-up question to this is also related to a question that someone else is asking. So I'm going to ask theirs and then, uh, you know, jump, like twist it to where I want to go. But uh, Paraphilus 075 is coming back in. Uh, how invasive will, the, will this type of procedure be? Are we talking removing parts of the skull and applying the treatment every time? And um, if so, will the idea be to create less invasive options over time? Could it be done via needle? Yeah, I was thinking as well, like if you have to like, I just imagine like a pie, like you take like 5% every time, but then uh, that sounds pretty horrible uh, as a way to uh, mentally think about it. So yeah, how, how do you yeah. see, the, how, yeah. how would you, how would you stage the change? And then I guess answer uh, paraphilus 075. Yeah, 5%, 15%. We're thinking more 15% based on the rate of uh, plasticity of the human neocortex in mm. people of uh, advanced age. Uh, but still, that, that, that means like, you know, maybe uh, quite, you know, six to 10 brain surgeries. Um, but yeah, there, you know, it is brain surgery. So, um, it, you know, you, you would make a craniotomy, uh, access the brain, um, do the procedures, and then uh, get the skull back and let it heal. Um, you know, this sounds um, undesirable, <laughs> but I don't know that there's a way of replacing tissue without doing that. And again, when you talk to neurosurgeons, which we've done because we're looking ahead uh, to the clinic, you know, this is something they do every day at work. You know, it's just a job for them. Um, and, and so it's not like this is something that doesn't occur all the time in hospitals across the world, you know, every day. It does, right? It's something we hope as individuals we don't have to do. Uh, but if it means, um, you know, reversing the age of your brain um, without loss of, of, of function or self-identity. Uh, I, I certainly would be open to that. And I, I'm guessing others might be as well. I've read of people, yeah, the, I've read of people that uh, they they go through one of the jug, jugulars or like things like through your leg or your armpit or, or I don't think they do the neck one. I don't know why. But anyways, they go up that way and then look, they'll cut apart a tumor with little little uh, little uh, scissors and so uh, and then like slowly suck it out. So I was wondering if you use micro robots, could you just cut out the section that's bad 
and then suck it out and then like like squirt out the, the new layer of brain and that way you wouldn't need to crack open someone's skull and do i feel it would be less invasive yeah, yeah i mean you know that if, if that technology looks like it could be used that would be of course much better uh, and it's not impossible uh as you describe it um it, it's probably easier but but still a good step in the right direction to be able to just like cut up a tumor and, and suck it out then to you know rebuild a starter tissue on site but maybe not impossible yeah um, yeah so yeah anybody wants to work on that in the meantime please yeah you can buy up the ip when it's ready and it'll have a home to be used um we talked about timeline the we talked about staging how how long it'll take to to slowly increment it over so i, I always wonder when it comes to the mice populations and if it was in the paper just, and i glass over it my apologies but when you replace it when you look at the baseline function and then after the uh how long does it take to get back to where they were in terms of functionality yeah so the other issue so it would happen uh i think within two months right so we did do some um physiological tests of our graphs to show that they respond to uh visual cues and they acquire that responsiveness over the course of two months um which sort of follows normal development of in pups of the same part of the brain so so really our graphs again we're are trying to do exactly what normal developing tissue does so it takes about two months um, in mice <clears throat> for human graphs it takes a lot longer so you know they really don't start coming online until six months and then they're still you know developing and differentiating for at least another six um, so it takes a lot longer and that's what you would expect uh, the time frame to start start to see that tissue uh, being used by the host. Um, you know, the, the, the difference, though, uh, between mice and primates um, is the level of compensation in mice is, is remarkable. Mice seem to be less dependent on their neocortex than we primates do uh, seem to be dependent on it. Um, in mice, you can uh, bilaterally lesion the entire motor cortex and uh, you know within a week they'll be up and running um, behaving normally scratching eating drinking uh, in humans you do that you know you're, you're paralyzed you don't <laughs> there's, there's no very little uh, recovery of function uh, over time if any um, and, and so it, it makes it a little more challenging to test certain things in mice when they're able to compensate even without new tissue so quickly. Um, so we're a bit limited in that sense as well, which is another reason why, you know, eventually we need to do this in primates of one species or another to ensure that it works. Is there a limit on when you can apply this technology? It doesn't sound like, it, let's say I had an injury like five years ago and I have you know, not a hundred percent yet. It seems like you just like cut around, you just cut a little bit more and then you'd add more, I guess. Like it doesn't seem like there'd be a limiting time factor in terms of like when an injury will happen or when you could be applying the it to a person. Yeah. I mean, if you have an injury and you have some tissue there that is non-functional like scar tissue or something and um, either removing it or displacing it and rebuilding a tissue underneath it, um, you know, the, if that's possible, then um, yeah, you could probably do it at any time. Um, the more progressive um, loss of functional tissue that occurs, for example, with aging, um, that requires, um, you know, as well as the progressive addition of tissue in, you know, maybe 15% at a time over the course of, you know, uh, probably a couple of decades, um, would also require removing the old tissue, right? And so we haven't, I mentioned that the, the, the plasticity that exists in the uh, neocortex where functions can move from one part 
uh, of the neural substrate to another over time. And that, that has been shown in humans for things like language, um, our personality, um, but it happens when there are the documented cases, when there's uh, a slow destruction of the original tissue from a pinpoint out. And that happens when there's benign um, gliomas, so brain tumors that are benign and operable. So they'll destroy the original tissue over time, you know, slowly enough, uh, a couple of years, um, from an initial pinpoint out. And if you're still using the function that was encoded uh, in that location during that time, it just gets re-encoded seamlessly elsewhere. So this has been observed in, in humans in their 50s, 60s, 70s, um, where they then you know, realize they have a brain tumor because they had a headache and went to the hospital or had a seizure because of the pressure and went to the hospital and had it removed. So now there's a big hole like in their language center, but they never lost the ability to speak. And when the surgeons check to see where the language is now encoded, it's a different part of the neocortex. So this gives us, you know, the precedence for being able to remove tissue at a slow rate, as well as add tissue. So if we silence and we have the technology to do it, or at least uh, to test it, if we can silence, uh, you know, 15% of the neocortex uh, over time, um, then, you know, we can remove that tissue, uh, the old tissue, making room for new young tissue at the same time. What What's would, that? yeah, now I'm following you, the, is this the best way to do that, to achieve that functionality? Is there like a way to use pluripotent stem cells or something else to be injected that would, you know, cannibalize the damaged tissue and then uh, regenerate itself from there? Um, is it, can you steel man any other approach besides the one you're using and banking your life on, I guess, is the question. Um, in, in terms of replacing the tissue, both the adding and removing aspects I, I, of it? I, I think on a higher level, just restoring function. Because if I, I wouldn't want you to like argue against a different approach to r removing and uh, replacing the tissue. Because that's yeah, yeah, I, that, that was sort of the idea, right, with the microglia as well, is, is you can, we have means of getting them in there and having them spread, and we could potentially convert them to new neurons, right, through, through cell reprogramming. Um, so th that's been done ex vivo, it has, for microglia, it hasn't been done in vivo, it's been done for other brain cell types in vivo. So it's conceivable that you could add new neurons, sort of, dispersed throughout the neocortex but it gets very complicated because you know neurons come in many different types and they're organized in a in a very um in a way that matters to their function so in the neocortex they're organized in layers and that's important for the information processing um, and so just adding new neurons um you know what type you know, are they going to be there in the right ratios compared to the other neurons? Are they going to be in the right place? It quickly gets complicated <clears throat> and much harder than just putting in new tissue, or new starter tissue that can develop the proper uh, composition and organization of cells um, on its own. Um, so, yeah, I mean, this is an approach that we thought about and actually invested a lot in early on um, until the, we realized that you know, right, it just doesn't make sense to try to overcome all these problems when the tissue, if we put it in right the first time, we'll know how to fix all this by itself. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, transition. Halstead19, who has been a long time listener, has a question. Uh, they're wondering your viewpoint, your their, your viewpoint on the role of extracellular matrix ECM and the damage that needs to be addressed. While most cells appear to be to have the capabilities to self-replicate, the ECM does not. Would he consider an approach that focuses only on replacing the ECM, leaving the rest of the work to stem cell therapies, senolytics, etc.? Yeah, I think um, that's a very good question. The uh, extracellular matrix, I think, is where much of 
the age-related damage occurs over time. And, and again, this is the stochastic forms of damage that have been well documented for long-lived extracellular proteins. Um, it, and it, you know, it happens in many different ways. There's, there's all, all, all sorts of forms of covalent modifications, breaks, aggregations, non-covalent, you know, aggregations. So it, it gets real ugly uh, over time. And a lot of that is extracellular. And we know this to some extent because we've done um, what I call heterochronic transplants. So taking young brain cells, putting them in an old brain, and guess what? They behave like old brain cells. Or taking old brain cells and putting them in a young brain, and then they behave like young brain cells. So their extracellular environment is very important uh, to how they're going to function. And I think you could um go a long way if you could reverse the extracellular damage you could go a long way in um, um you know reversing or at least uh, extending the 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 life of of a brain uh, by doing that uh, the difficulty though again is that the, this damage is complex there's no genetically encoded machinery for dealing with it so you have to now invent new machinery that doesn't exist, that can specifically target like uh, covalent bonds that are damaged and not touch ones that are normal, um, which is very difficult. Although you're, the, the person asking the question, I think may have possibly been alluding to more wide scale, just like, you know, let's just degrade the ECM and, and then have cells produce a new one. Uh, again, Conceptually, that would make sense, but implementing it uh, without, again, losing, uh, you know, who you are and, and uh, might be might be very difficult to do. I, you know, again, I don't see a way of doing that. There's no way of getting rid of, of, of this cross-linked damaged protein. Um, so you, you'd have to invent some new technology there. You know, is it impossible? No, but again, I can't, I, I don't see an easy way forward to doing that. Hmm. Well, Halstead, maybe there's an opportunity for you to get a PhD and solve this very problem. The related to aging, you never know. The, they could be a researcher right now and they're just looking for more, uh, you know, jurisprudence and other ideas. But uh, related to aging, Cosmic Existentialist, that is a fun name. Uh, are you aware of the thermodynamic theory on aging if the theory? turns out to be true, would current aging and neurological generation therefore be for, uh, futile? And they gave me a link on it, so I can read it if you don't know it. Yeah, yeah, please do. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> so uh, the thermodynamic theory of aging explains changes of the functions of states of cells and tissues during aging. The rate of aging depending on the genetic factors, the nature of habitat, nutrition, and external uh, influences. These rates can be different aging organisms basically just describes it longer um i imagine it's like the thermodynamic thing it's like one of the three laws of thermodynamics i don't know physics so i don't know how to ask this question better yeah yeah i you know th there are multiple theories of aging um i'm not a big fan of theories of aging i think we know enough about what happens with aging again this damage to the extracellular matrix is a big part of it, but also DNA damage um, and, and damage to other classes of macromolecules, which are understudied, probably also occurs. But we know there's enough damage there that um, is a driving force. Um, again, because uh, by itself can cause, you know, all the other uh, hallmarks uh, of aging. So this damage is something that we we need to address um, if we're going to be aging. And so getting back to the question, maybe you could reread the question about trying to think of how this thermodynamic theory might. Uh, I don't understand it. Cosmic, please just comment and maybe I'll just post it to them because it just seems like it's the, uh, the natural deg degradation the aging organisms, functional systems, and tissues as their diseases lead decrease decrease of adaptability of organism and eventually its death. So it's just like normal death. I'm sorry, Cosmic. I don't understand this question either. 
I mean, it's hard to disagree with that statement. Though, yeah. Right? It just feels it's, like normal aging. So then, yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah. I, Cosmic. I hope you uh, don't make fun of me for doing a bad job asking your question. So, and then just add a comment, and I'll I'll, I'll send it to to John. So, um, yeah. Grizzle Town. Uh, what new town, Grizzle Town? For the record, we talked about startups and uh, being spun out of your your research lab. Are there other ones besides the one you mentioned previously? And does it have a name? Can you say these things, or are you like under wraps? Like, so what other startups have spun out of your research from your lab? Is the main question from Grizzle Town, and then I I, I peppered you with two other ones. Yeah, I mean, we don't even have a web page yet, uh, but the tissue engineering um, company is called BE Therapeutics. Mm. You could still, is, it, is there time to change it to Lowell Therapeutics? Like, no, no reason. I just feel like it would be great. No, okay, I'll stop. Um, and then the, there is a microglia uh, spinoff. Mm. Um, and, the, the, you know, the person taking the lead there uh, is, is someone else, uh, Robert Cargill. Um, mm. and, so he's, um, you know, he's uh, co-founded with me a company called Gleonics. You mentioned yeah. on your website. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, that's it. Yeah. Okay. You mentioned on your website that you're always looking for people to join your lab, and you have two startups that are spinning out with your technology. What are there? Are there core people that are core skill sets, core core experience type people that you're looking for that's hard to find? Like, there's some people. It's like I don't know. Maybe you're easier to find. But like, who are like the rare uh, gazelles? Out. I don't know what the uh, the analogy I would use there, but what are the rare types of people that you're looking for they can't find? Yeah, so <clears throat> there's a couple of people we're looking for uh, right now for um, BE, um, the, the tissue engineering company. It stands for brain engineering. Um, one is a tissue engineer, someone who has uh, more experience with um, developing biogels that have the properties that we want. So we can do a lot on our own, but uh, you know, in terms of optimizing things, we could use uh, a lot of expertise there. Um, that that's the main thing there. Um, we can also use uh, somebody who has some experience with uh, surgeries. Again, we do all of those our, ourselves, um, and we collaborate with with, with surgeons as well. Um, but to have someone full time on site um, doing some of that would be uh, helpful. This is all in the New York area, right? You're not like moving this to a, a lower cost of living place. Yeah, for, for now we're in the New York area. Oh. Yeah. I'm going to suggest yeah. the Midwest because Madison has a great place and it's cheap. But uh, I had a commenter saying that it's annoying that I, I suggest that so much. <laughs> I don't know if you can cut the cost by a third. Why not? You're building something pretty hard. The, yeah. do, you have, do you have any plans to move out of New York or is it just like that's your home? So it, it, there's a, a fixed cost there in terms of where you're or move, willing to yeah, move. It. It's sort of the same as, you know, home being academia or industry. I don't care, you know, okay. it's where the project is. So if the project can better be done elsewhere, I'll move. No problem. Sweet. I'll get you a lab space out here. What books would you recommend people check out or read? Either related to your work, unrelated to work. You do have a book that I'm going to link into the show notes, but um, even the, the things that you enjoy in your free time. Is it mystery? Whatever. Sherlock Holmes? Uh, yeah, uh, what I, books? Haven't, I haven't read a book for a little while. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. Um, gosh. Yeah, I'll have to come back to you on that. <laughs> well, we can recommend yours. What's the name of your book? Oh, it's called Replacing Aging. There you go. <laughs> then uh, what advice would you give to people who are out there? The typical age of the podcast seems to be about 25 to 35. So there's a, like a big section of like plus 55 year olds that are listening in. Uh, what advice would you give to people who aren't, who, who want to get more involved? Um, yeah, I mean, first thing is to, I think, educate yourselves as much as possible on what's being tried now to, to um, address aging and, and be very critical and seek out opposing views um, to try and make up your own opinion. Uh, because there are prevalent views out there and you know some people just drink the kool-aid and, and you know are, are cheerleaders for a certain approach when when really in my opinion you know that approach has zero chance and yet it's a very um you know prevalent view that you know oh this is you know worth trying so you know be critical get educated um and then depending on your skill set you know um there, there could be ways that you could help um, 
disseminate information yourself or or you know um if you if you have means help fund uh certain projects you think are worthwhile um or it, you know if you have any uh, a science background then there there's probably room for you to directly work in some of these projects because they are very multidisciplinary i mean lowell you brought up a couple of areas that we're not doing but that could very well complement what we're doing in addition to the stem cell work uh you know the very wet lab type of stuff that we do um that's what i would suggest i guess but yeah do get involved we need more people involved is there, there a network as well for uh you know nathan cheng has this uh network with uh um lifespan bio yeah, right yeah um and so contacting them uh to see where you might fit in best uh, to help the overall fight against aging. Um, that would be a good starting place as well. Is there a place for people who are self-taught? I guess that the coders for machine learning up a solution for you would be one of them, but um, there's a lot of people that don't have PhDs necessarily. So then yeah. is there a place for someone like that? Yeah, if they have the skills, the degree is kind of irrelevant, I think. Um, you know, I, I have a student in my lab who is completely self-taught and does a lot of the uh, computational analyses. So, you know, along with a little bit of coding for the high resolution analysis we do of fetal tissue to try to reverse engineer it again, to make sure, for example, that the cells we're generating in the lab, you know, match the normal cells that are there in a human fetus. Um, this is called single cell sequencing and the analysis that goes with it. And he's completely self-taught, so he doesn't need, you know, it's good that he did that. He's also trying to get a degree at the same time, mm -hmm. but you certainly don't need a degree to be able to be uh, very useful and helpful. Um, yeah, unless you want to be a surgeon, you have to get a degree. You are not letting anyone go up the street and have that role. <laughs> really? Yeah. 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 The, uh, so enough concentrate is probably gonna be our last uh, question of the day. Enough concentrate is related to surgery. So that's a, a on point joke. Can you predict any non surgical methods of tissue replacement? I asked you this question earlier. The, for example, intranasal delivery, they might have lower friction to use in terms of it, I'm thinking about the ways that surgical procedures make medical treatments much more infrequent and require further disease progression to justify. Uh, I can't exactly go to the brain doc for tune up by taking a long lunch. That's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, this is not a, uh, you know, something you do over your lunchtime, not yet anyway. Um, mm -hmm. There are other uh, delivery, um, uh, you know, routes for cells like intranasal um, or, you know, uh, CSF, so like through the, the circulating uh, cerebrospinal fluid. Um, as opposed to intracranially directly uh, um, by making a hole or, or a craniotomy. Um, but it, but again, you know, for what we're doing that those right now don't seem possible. Um, the closest non intracranial approach might be the one you mentioned Lowell, where somehow you can smartly go up a, a, a vein or a blood vessel and then be able to, you know, reconstruct what we want. Um, the issue again is is that you know the, the starter tissue that's needed to get normal um, mature tissue, the organization of that tissue has to be right, um, and you can't do that just by injecting cells in the circulation in the cerebrospinal fluid or intranasally, um, mm -hmm. and that's that's actually been the big um, roadblock to making progress. In, in repairing the neocortex. People have been putting cells in there for a century and, and you know, and, and repair has not occurred yet. And that's because no one has put in something that looks remotely like normal tissue because it doesn't have the structure. So we really need to get the structure of that tissue to be uh, normal for the function to be normal. How do you, so if there's a, if there's a graft set in front of us, there's a brain, there's a graft in it. So there's a little, little, I don't know, uh, inverse piece of the, the brain missing. How do you layer in the cells right now to be in there? You don't just like 
wad it up beforehand and then inject it. So I meant it sounds like you like layered in uh, in a specific order. Yeah, so there's some layering that can be done in vivo, um, but again, there's some preparation of the cells that can be done ex vivo, so before we, we do the graft. There are certain key aspects of brain development in general, but particularly for the neocortex um, that we need to um, recapitulate. So certain interactions between the cells are known you know, across mammalian species to guide this layered structure that, that we need to achieve to get normal function. Um, and some of that can we can prepare a little bit before grafting and then do more once it's grafted as well. I was thinking of when they build a house and they're putting the foam up, there's some that, that you roll out, but there's some that's just in a, a hose that you spray it down and then you layer it outwards. So I was thinking if you're coming from some type of ventricle, you go in there and just like layer the one that's closest to the skull and then, you know, like a cake, which I, I'm, I hope that's not as, as simple as that, but uh, maybe that would work. And if so, I, I trademark that and you have to pay me. So, but, <laughs> would that work? All in the details, though. Yeah, <laughs> yeah true. <laughs> I don't trademark that. Don't worry. The, the so for aging, you mentioned that there's um, I can, It is hard to tell who's who are the people that are probably better to be watching, and p- some of the people who aren't. And I'm I'm not gonna like have you like you know, be mean to anyone. So who would be some of the people that you recommend people just be following their work? Because there are, there are some that I found. That's people say the nice things on the website, those are the nice things in public. But if you start looking at the details, like you said, the devil's in the details, and there's definitely mm-hmm. some devils in those details. So, who, who are the people that actually work out to be uh, angels versus devils when you look into the details? Um, yeah, so I, I like uh, Alexander Fedensev. He's, um, you know, certainly has the right perspective as to what needs to be reversed in aging if we're going to be aging. So he understands the complexity of the damage and and, um, that that is what we need to address. He's more focused on the ECM. You know, some argue that DNA damage is is the driving force of aging. I don't think that's the case. I think it's a contributing force. The ECM, there's a stronger case to be made that it's more of a, it kills us sooner than DNA damage does. Um, but still, I think they all need to be addressed. But at least a- Alexander, you know, has um, the right um, appreciation for for what is aging and, and what it is that we need to be fighting. Um, and then this may go go back to this thermodynamic model of aging, right? This is things are falling apart uh, at that level, um, it, and so. Um, you know, I, the approaches he's taking, I think, are more to target the the, uh, the ECM specifically, which, again, uh, I, I find that difficult to imagine how he might successfully do that. But but uh, um, he, I still think he's, he's worth uh, following what they're doing. Um, right. Then there are other people that are not considered as, um, you know, anti-aging researchers or life extension researchers. Uh, that I think are, are really important to follow. Um, and those are the ones that are building replacement parts for the body. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, uh, a lot of them are, are building biological replacements. Again, if you replace a old body with a young body, you know, we know the young body will last longer. Uh, so we already have a proof of concept. And so, you know, there are people working on replacing whole body at once, but there are also others that are uh, working on replacing body parts like organs and, and um, you know, different combinations of organs um, by growing them in the lab so that they're you know, uh, devoid of any age related uh, damage um, and then um, transplanting those. Um, one of the biggest groups working on that is uh, Anthony Atala's group at Wake Forest. Um, he's, he's got a, a big operation there and they, they've had some success, um, but um, I think they're, they're definitely somebody to keep an eye on. Um, people are also working on synthetic replacements. Um, mm. uh, Nod Sestan at Yale is a very interesting, uh, completely synthetic replacement for the body. 
called uh, Brain X. Hmm. Um, I don't know if you've heard of them. No, I haven't. I, I'm just wondering what would be the replacement. You may, have heard, you may have heard the headlines. I think they took hmm. like pig brains an hour after the pigs died and were able to keep the brains alive and, and you know, metabolically active uh, without a body. So a completely synthetic, you know, uh, replacement, you know, a circulatory system that filters the blood, oxygenates the blood, uh, removes the CO2. Um, it's pretty wild, but you know, if, if you think it's okay to be a cyborg in the future, have a biological brain, but be in a completely cyborg body, you know, that's that's a. It, I I I'm always excited to see what what they're coming up with as well. Yeah, my my preference is to try to slow or hinder any technology that ends up with me being a brain in a jar. <laughs> so. Uh, but I also see yeah. the value of the technology, so I won't be mean to them. But that does sound interesting. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, uh, brain in the jar, yeah, it doesn't seem worth it. But, you know, if if that brain is is well matched with a brain-machine interface that where, where you're getting input as well as uh, being able to control, you know, your artificial limbs or whatever, um, then it's not so bad, right? You, you actually wouldn't know the difference. Your brain wouldn't know the difference, whether that whether the the visual perceptions you're getting are coming from an artificial retina or a real retina, your brain wouldn't know the difference. And then when you move an arm and you see it move, you know, um, but again, you, you, I don't know that you would know a difference. If it's I, done well, we're, you know, we're not yeah. there yet. So we're, we're talking future now. <laughs> How do you know that you're not a brain in a jar and that the what you know was stunted so that you don't think it's possible so that you don't question it like in the matrix yeah i we don't <laughs> <laughs> you don't okay you seem pretty comfortable with it so all right i guess it's, a, it's all the same yeah yeah all right well i want to thank everybody for coming out today especially you uh gene for uh sharing your knowledge and uh, tolerating my jokes um thanks for coming on the show today yeah thanks for having me though at any point in this conversation if you find value in it please subscribe. It is hugely beneficial and it tells Google and everyone out there that this is content worth watching. Thank you for everyone thus far who has commented, liked, subscribed, and told their friends.